We play and call it work. Hey everybody, Matthew here from AnyWarGaming.com and welcome to this week's Sit and Talk. It feels like forever since I've done one of these because we missed a couple of weeks at least due to just scheduling conflicts and all of that. I think it's been like two months since I've done a Sit and Talk, so I'm excited to answer your questions again. But before we get into that, of course, next week's guest is normally Josh, but uh, we have an additional guest star, which will be Lee. So you can leave questions for both Josh and Lee, or just Josh, or just Lee. It's totally up to you. Just make sure you specify who you're talking to when you put the comment in. So just be like, Josh, blah, 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 Lee, blah, 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 and they'll both be happy to answer your questions next week. And of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, you won't be able to leave comments there. You have to go to our site to leave the comments. Just easier for us to organize them. And then we just answer them pretty much in random orders. Of course, if you want certain questions to be answered, thumb them up, because we do answer the ones that have been thumbed up a lot first. And uh, yeah, so we got half an hour here for free and then half an hour for our vault members, which will be at the link in the video description below. I'm just gonna jump right into it. Karothu, will there be any Christmas specials from you guys? Maybe dress Josh up as Santa and have Dave and Quirk be elves or something, or any extra content during the holidays. I don't know, we didn't end up doing a Halloween special, honestly, just because of time. We were swamped, we were, we were super busy. I wanted to do one. I was actually thinking of one, but I just couldn't find a day that we could actually film a Halloween special. And so we didn't end up doing one. Will we do a Christmas special? I, I don't know. I like the idea of doing them, but um, just with everything that's going on, we're, okay, let, let me give you some ideas. Like we got our regular content that we always have to keep up on, and that is the 40K for Mondays and Fridays, Fantasy for Saturdays, Age of Sigmar for Tuesdays. Our, and then, then we have our narrative campaigns that come out on Wednesdays. We're starting literally, to, well, today, for you, for that, that you guys are watching this uh, tomorrow for us, because I'm recording this on Thursday. We're starting Blood Bowl Season 2, our Blood Bowl League Season 2, which we're super excited about. Seven people are participating in that, and we're doing a, a ton of games. We're doing a full round robin, which is 21 games in the, the main season, and then there will be semifinals and finals for the top four teams. So a total of, well, 21 games at first, and then the semifinals and finals are best of three, so at least another six games there, upwards of nine games. So that's a lot of games, 27 to 30 games. So we have a lot of filming there. I've been working, we're still filming the Space Hulk Death Watch campaign, which takes a lot of time just to get a pair of episodes out is about three or four days of work, uh, one day of filming, but then lots of work behind the scenes that Josh and I do. Josh does a lot of the writing. Both of us meet together and discuss scenarios and the story. So there's, there's a lot of work there. And there, all this chaos stuff is coming out starting next week. Thousand Suns next week and then general chaos stuff the week after. So that'll get Dave super busy. And at the same time, he's starting another narrative campaign that pretty soon with the side scroller thing that you may have seen on Facebook. So, and this is all on top of our regular content. So it's great, we're busy, but it, it's, it's hard to find these little times to do these extra special stuff. So I don't know, no plans right now, but it's only the end of November, so something might come up. As for extra content during the holidays, I would say we'll be lucky just to keep up with content during the holidays because we'll, we take a lot of extra time off to, the, during the Christmas and New Year's break. Um, so we actually lose a lot of manpower, so I'll be happy just during that time to keep up with our regular scheduled content, let alone anything extra. So that's our plan, is for you not to see any interruptions in the content that we normally put out, just because I, I just feel that Vault members are paying a monthly subscription, and so just having all of a sudden a month where half of the month we're not giving them full of what they're normally used to, even if they are technically getting their money's worth just because it's not that expensive, I just don't feel comfortable with that. So that's going to be our goal, is just to maintain the status quo during the holidays when we're going to be down a lot of man hours. But it would be funny to see Josh as Santa and David Quirks as elves. Bloodshot VX. I've been curious about this subject, but have yet to find a definitive answer on it. What is the difference between a broodlord and a patriarch? Hope you can answer this for me, and thanks for all the quality content you and the guys produce for us, Robbie. There's a fluff dif difference between the two. A broodlord and a patriarch might uh, appear, they, they probably, they kind of used to be one and the same, and as the fluff has evolved, they've, they've diverged. A broodlord is totally under the control of the Tyranid Hive and exists basically just to lead a group of gene stealers. Uh, Patriarch is the one gene stealer who was the first 
to start a genes to the cult on a planet or on a space hulk or wherever it happens to be. So what happens is when the gene stealers infest a new planet, the first gene stealer basically to implant and enthrall a victim gains some psychic power and starts to, it's almost like the orcs, the more they fight, the bigger they get. Well, the gene stealer, it's this, the more they enthrall, the stronger this patriarch gets and he grows in size and psychic abilities. So they've got these genetics inside of them that basically activate once the one that is going to be the patriarch is designated in the hive, the little hive mind, the little brood mind as the patriarch. And so <clears throat> before you kind of look at them as the same because they talk about the patriarch and they would just give it brood lord stats. But now that we actually have a genes to their cult codex, they have differentiated them a lot more. They have similar profiles, similar, but now we've got things like the patriarch having access to a whole slew of different psychic powers. It's access to biomancy, telepathy, and the brood mind, whereas the brood lord only has access to the powers of the hive mind and only the horror at that. He has a preset one. So, so you can, and you can have multiple brood lords in a hive, but technically in a genes to their cult, you can only have one patriarch. And when that patriarch dies, another genius to their will eventually morph into a patriarch. And so they are, they are different fluff-wise, but they're very similar. So you kind of, you kind of, if you want to look at it in the simplest terms, it's that a patriarch is a broodlord that's not in the Tyranid hive mind who's controlling a genius to their cult. And a broodlord is like a patriarch that's in the hive mind that's just controlling a small amount of gene stealers. So, and that's currently what the fluff is at. But it does change. They, they kind of evolve it, they retcon it sometimes, and it just, which like any good fluff will do, because when you design something in the 80s, 30 years later, sometimes you need to make changes just to make it cool and not just 80-ish, as you can probably guess some of that stuff looks like and acts like. Kassadar the Spymaster. Matt, I hope you are having a wonderful day slash evening slash afternoon. Uh, in this case, it's day or morning whichever happens to be the correct time. And I'd like to thank you for putting together such an awesome team of content creators, painters, and so on. Well, you're welcome, and thank you for the compliment. With that out of the way, time to get to my questions. One, assuming a war boss could get to Angron's level of strength and power, he definitely can, by the way, in the modern Imperium, how screwed is the Emperor's dom domain? Well, if you want to know the answer to that, I would read the Beast Arises series, because essentially, um, it, it happens. I'll just say that. The, the beast is a Primarch level orc war boss, in fact. I don't want to give any spoilers. But let's just say that you might even be slightly above that level. So how screwed is the Imperium? Well, I can tell you from reading the series, pretty darn screwed. Two, do you like the Canadian flag or maple syrup more? I'm asking for a friend. I don't know how to answer that question. That's like saying, do you like air or food better? And you know, they're just, they're just two different things. I love maple syrup and I am proud to be Canadian so I guess I care about the flag. So I'd say that they're of equal importance because while the Canadian flag has a maple leaf on it and as we all know maple syrup is made from a maple tree so obviously it's very Canadian in both senses even though you can have obviously maple syrup in other countries as well but I think I'm assuming, assuming there's maple trees in other parts of the world than just Canada. I know it's a northern thing so you're not going to get it down south and all of that. But I love maple syrup, especially on pancakes, chocolate chip pancakes, or blueberry pancakes. Not plain pancakes, not a big fan. Or on waffles, or with sausages. But uh, Canadian flag, obviously, is important as well. I do love my country. So I'm not like super duper, super duper, duper, duper patriot patriotic, but I uh, still appreciate my country. And so I do like the Canadian flag. Three, are you familiar with the more positive aspects of the Chaos Gods? Uh, for example, creativity for Zinch, honor for corn, etc. And do you think GW will ever make a mention of them outside of fluff? I am familiar with that. Like Nurgle, when you read about Nurgle, for example, he's not about, he, he is about decay, but it's more he's about change and he sees a beauty in it all. But uh, the Chaos Gods, I still think overall are meant to be evil. I know some people say, oh, no, it's more neutral, it's just a reflection of us. Well, it's kind of a reflection of all the bad stuff of us, though. You don't see a Chaos God of kindness or a chaos god of charity, or a chaos god of good marriages. Like you just don't, even though those exist in the Imperium, you still don't see one of those chaos gods. Um, and so obviously they're meant to be more the, the base parts of us, the you know, death and destruction and, and disease and lust and, and excess. And Zinch obviously, he's, it's more like, I guess he's more like the god of manipulation and deceit and, 
and the mafia, that kind of stuff. Everything that's kind of like secret and trying to, to manipulate things. So I know that there are, they do mention some of the positive stuff, but I don't know if I really buy into that. I still look at them as pretty much being pure evil. You know, it's, it's all of our evil being over there, but it's created evil stuff, essentially. Hive Weasel, I just started playing 40k a couple months ago and chose Tyranids to be my army. I have watched every video involving Tyranids in and outside the vault. Wow, that's a lot of videos. I simply must have more. Any chance of some new Tyranid games coming out? Thanks for releasing such awesome content. Always. I'm not going to stop playing Tyranids. Obviously, Gene Stitter Cult is the one that's my favorite right now, but I always go back to my other armies, even Necrons and Tau and Space Marines. But um, you're not going to see a ton of them because I don't put out a ton of beatmap map ups I do a lot of the other stuff like narrative campaigns or Blood Bowl and all of that, so... But yeah, you'll definitely see more Tyranids. Another lemming. Vimeo is absolutely horrid on iPad. Do you have any plans to move off that platform? We don't. Honestly, I have looked through all the different options, and unless you have an idea that I don't even know about, Vimeo has ended up being the best. YouTube, of course, is the best, but they don't allow us to do what Vimeo allows us to do, which is charge people for access to the videos. They, they, that's specifically against their policies. Now, you can, you can use YouTube Red, but they take a big chunk and it doesn't give us control like we need to have for our vault membership. So, so yeah, so I, no plans right now. I've looked into other things. There are, like, don't get me wrong, there, is, there was one, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a better one, but the cost difference is just astronomical. Like we're talking about going from, um, well, by a factor of, I'd say, at least 100, meaning like it costs 100 times more than what we're currently paying with Vimeo. So, and now mind you, Vimeo is pretty cheap, but this was pretty expensive. We're talking tens of thousands, high tens of thousands of dollars to use this other platform. Of course, it's a better platform, but um, it's just, just for the size of company that we are, that would be incredibly cost prohibitive. So we just, we just can't. That, that, the Vimeo is the best one for the price that it's at, and it, it's, it does its job enough. And I, I know there's some frustrations with it, but... Um, it's the best for what we're trying to do with it. So unless you know, if you, can, if you want to make suggestions, I am, I am always open to new platforms. We've switched platforms a couple times over the course of this business. And so if you know of another one that allows you to charge for enter or to, to watch the videos, but not like charge through them like YouTube does, but let you just decide when, basically that you make a video private and you can embed it on a, on a website and nobody can just take the link and share it with their friends and it doesn't, it doesn't go against their terms, and it doesn't have any ads on it, it has to be ad-free, and it doesn't cost tens of thousands of dollars a year in order to have. If you, can, if you can suggest something like that, I'd love to hear it. I'm not being sarcastic, I'm totally serious. I'm always looking for new ones, so just leave a comment. Just saying, Matt, I think I found one, and I will check the comments for that. Elijah Valentine, howdy Matthew, I have a couple questions for you. I am just coming back into 40k since second edition rules, and wow, a lot has changed. Well, yeah, yeah, it's like five editions later, probably a new edition coming next year, which might change a lot more. Found a couple of friends to play with, they primarily have Eldar and Tau armies, I'm sorry. I'm running a Tyranid army, and I'm having a hard time during the battles against them. Any tips for a Nid army against the heavy long-range firepower that they are bringing? Um, you're going to have a hard time. I'm just going to tell you that right away. It depends on them, like how good they are at it and what kind of army they've built. But if they're even half decent, the Eldar and Tau provide some pretty stiff challenges for the Tyranids. The best way to play Tyranids, if you're looking just, just to beat somebody else, is you're looking at at least a couple Flying Hive Tyrants. Right? At least a couple. A lot of people will bring three. They use the High Fleet Leviathan Detachment to bring three HQs. Or heck, you can do two combined arms attachments as long as you want to bring enough troops. So bring in three hive, flying hive tyrants, but two, two's enough. And then I'd say uh, spamming zone thropes, uh, both individually and in groups of three with malin or with um, neurothropes, so you can get the spirit leech psychic power. And so those those will kind of really if you combine all that, you get a lot of psychic that helps you shut down the Eldar psychic. And against Tau, they'll have no defense against it, and you can just start using Spirit Leech to suck the brains right out of them, and that, that's very effective. Um, Venom Thropes are really nice. Against Tau, they'll be less effective because they have a lot more ignore cover, but against Eldar, they can be effective. They do have some psychic powers that allow them to ignore the shrouded aspect, but um, uh, the Venom Thropes with groups of Gaunts around them can be very annoying, so you can... but. You'll need to have a couple detachments in order to be able to get enough of these elite slots because Zone Thropes are elite, Venom Thropes are elite, 
Hive Guard are pretty good if you give them just their regular Impaler cannons, but once again, they're an elite as well. Um, you're really going to have to min-max in order to be able to face off against a half-decent Eldar or Tau army, unfortunately. Or your friends could be nice and bring weaker lists so that you can have more of a fun game. But if they're not going to do that, then those are some tips for how to play your Tyranids a little stronger. But uh, yeah, and just start searching online as well for people's ideas because there's a lot of good ideas for how to play any army online. Second question, I just watched all your Tyrus Incident narrative campaign. It convinced me to become a Vault member. Loved it. Well, thank you. Your poor Genie Stealers couldn't climb to save their life. Yeah, I think in a future campaign, I'd have Genie Stealers have a skill that lets them auto-climb, because there just seems something wrong. It was hilarious, but there seems something wrong about them not being able to climb out of a window, fall like a few feet, and die. Whereas like Genie Stealers, they should be skittering all over the place. Kind of like goblins in Lord of the Rings. They had a rule that allowed them to just automatically climb. I think I'd give that to Genie Stealers as well in a future campaign, just to make them more interesting. It was funny, but it happened way too often, and so it kind of broke what they're normally able to do. I normally run D&D &D sessions, and I was surprised that it never occurred to me to do a role-playing 40k campaign. My question for you is, how did you come up with the rules for each narrative campaign, such as the upgrades after every battle? That's been an evolution of sorts. Uh, I've gotten inspiration from things like Gorka Morka, um, we did our first Death Watch campaign at the Augustine Station about a year ago, not quite a year ago, and the upgrade for that was really, really simple. It was basically uh, D66, and it was just a table of all the special rules, all the universal special rules, but I found that it was too random, so people couldn't really specialize, and so then I liked the Gork and Morka's way of doing it. So it's been, more, it's been an evolution of seeing different systems. I like Blood Bowl systems, so I might incorporate some of that in the next Death Watch one, or the next one that has upgrades, because uh, you have even more control over choosing your skills. Um, I kind of, it was a shot in the dark for how much experience people should get. And so the current system that we have is, ki is pretty good for that. But honestly, it's just we kind of make stuff up. And it's just a compilation of experience and guesswork. And then we just kind of go with what we learned from previous campaigns. You can download pretty much most of the rules for stuff that I come up with. If you go to miniwargaming.com and you click on Tools and Rules, then there's usually the links there for like the Death Watch campaign or the Tyrus incident. And you can take a look at those and get inspiration from those. You can, I, I, I basically get inspiration from everywhere, steal ideas that I like and incorporate them in and modify them for the specific purposes of the campaigns that we're doing. So yeah, yeah, that's the best I can tell you for that. Sticky Blue Toffee. Matt, official FAQs just out. Yeah, for the main rule book. Have you had a chance to digest them by the time you record this? Clearly not after 30 minutes or so. What are your thoughts? Perhaps you could do a vid breaking them down. I've mostly looked through them. I noticed that they changed the jinking thing for transports. So, so passengers inside of a jinking transport are no longer counting as jinking. They don't have to snap fire. I don't know if I 100% agree with that. I know Steve's happy because now his Dark Eldar aren't totally nerfed. But, you know, it kind of makes sense that if you're shaking up a vehicle. It always felt weird when my Necron Ghost Arc would jink but all my Necrons inside were firing at full ballistic skill. Like, there's a reason that a jinking vehicle snap fires. It's because it's supposed to represent it flying all over the place, dodging, and so it has a harder time tracking, tracing a shot. Well, the guys inside would have the same thing. So I do agree that they should have been, that they jink as well, but rules was written, it was never there. That's why we didn't play it that way. I'm glad that psychic powers that don't have a profile don't need to roll to hit. I think that's very good. Uh, the grenades thing still bums me out. They still decided that you can only use one grenade in the assault phase. And I know rules is written, you could interpret it that way. It was pretty, it was controversial because of the way things were worded. It wasn't very well worded. But they've made it very clear now in the FAQ, which I don't like. Just because a lot of things in 30k really get hurt by that. Like you pay like 25 points to your squad to get melted bombs. Or a sergeant pays 5 points to get it. Now obviously you're just going to pay 5 points for the sergeant to get it. Because why pay 25 points for a whole squad when only one can use it? I realize it gives redundancy that you don't have to worry about the guy dying that has the melted bombs. But is that worth 25 points? Probably not. You'll pro start seeing other things like chain fists, or it'll just change the meta away from certain grenades. Also, things like Tau. Not that Tau don't. It's not that Tau can't handle this, but it, it, I'll never give EMP grenades to a large squad of Tau fire warriors. Maybe a min squad of five, because they cost two points per guy, and you have to give it to all of them. You can't just like say each guy that wants to take EMP grenades pays two points. And that's a nine-point model, so that's a hefty upgrade cost, like a ten-man squad that's 20 points, and that's a lot when only one of them can use it per phase. But maybe a five-man squad could still take them, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt quite as much. Um, what else was there that was major stuff? Um, I have, I've mostly looked through it, There's, I still want to comb through it a bit more, but um, 
that seems to be the major thing. So they, they seem to keep most of the stuff that they were talking about and they modified a few of them. You still can't take an infiltrating character or a character with infiltrate and join it to a non-infiltrating unit, even if neither of them intend to infiltrate, which infiltration is now optional, which is good. So that kind of sucks for the Gene Stitter cult, because all the HQ choices have infiltrate. And if you bring a combined arms attachment, none of your guys have infiltrate except Gene Stealers. And so your your all your HQ choices, which are very, very fragile, except maybe the Patriarch can't join anybody, and gene stealers can only be joined by patriarchs. And so your Primus and your um, Magus always have to start the game, if you're in a combined arms attachment, not joining any squads. And that seems a little broken to me. Like, not broken as in overpowered or underpowered, but just like, it kind of feels weird. I'm gonna deploy everything, but my Magus and Primus have to start on the outside. Hopefully I get first turn, so they'll just run and join a squad. Otherwise, he can just take him out first turn if he has even things like barrage weapons, or just has line of sight with something and it gets through. So that kind of sucks. Uh, so I disagree with that wording, but um, it is what it is. But yeah, overall, I, those are the main things that kind of pop out in my mind. Uh, let's see, that's for Steve, that's for Steve. Miso Miso, Matt, are you worried about the rumors that GW is going to simplify the 40k rules in the new edition and make them more Age of Sigmar-like? They're not going to go full Age of Sigmar, apparently, but they're going to seriously pare them down. No, I'm not worried about that. Because I don't think they're going to do like Age of Sigmar and give them four pages of rules. But I think the rule set right now is incredibly bloated. And so it could do with some, uh, with some simplifying. I, I still don't like the psychic phase the way it is. I, I don't think the way it was, where you just everything with a power just had to make a leadership test and it could use it. Because it made like psychic armies, like if they changed it back to that, holy cow, Gene Seeder Cult would be even more ridiculous. Tyranids would get a huge buff. But then so would things like Eldar and Grey Knights. Basically anything that can spam Psychers would all of a sudden be able to cast like everything. And so, um, so I'm not worried about it. Um, 40k is, is, is kind of, how do I put this? It's not the greatest rule set out there for tabletop wargaming. It's not, the rule set is not what makes the game great. What makes the game great is the setting and the models. If you'll notice, I have my most fun in narrative campaigns where I kind of throw the rules out and I make up my own on the spot. And if you want to ask Stephen Quirk, they see this all the time. I'm just like, okay, now we're going to do it this way. Now this happens and now we've got all these special rules. It's, that's almost like me trying to just fix up the rules to work more for my situation. And so and it is, the game is so far from balanced, like incredibly far from balanced, and has all sorts of wacky stuff in it. But it it kind of works in the sense that it's just, it's just got so much stuff that you can kind of play it in all these different ways. And I appreciate a game that can do that. But it, it could use with, it, it, over the years it's become bloated and I think it could use with a little more simplification. Not like Age of Sigmar level simplification, because I think that goes a little too far. I'm not saying Age of Sigmar is not a good game, but it's just not what I want for 40k. It's, it's just a different kind of idea. And, and I know Age of Sigmar gets very complicated once you introduce all the armies. The main rules are four pages, but really the rules are a lot longer than that because every unit has its own page of special rules. So that adds up as well. But I still think four pages is a little uh, excessive as a cut down to that because there's just too many situations that you want to be able to do and so it doesn't allow them to really explore all the different possibilities of what can happen. So I'm not worried. I, I'm looking forward to it because the more they, okay, let me put it this way too. From a business perspective, the more they change, the more an uproar everybody will be, and the more views we'll get covering it, which means more vault members, which means more money, which means the business grows. So if they just did like tiny changes, then nobody would really care, and so we wouldn't get more views and all that kind of stuff. So I remember when Age of Sigmar came out, holy cow, the views we got and the vault signups we got just for talking about it on a reroll episode that the guys just put together saying, hey, let's just talk about it. They showed nothing, they just talked about it. And that got a ton of alt signups because everybody was super interested in that because it was a major change. So business-wise, I am very looking forward to it for next year. Very much looking forward to it, I should say. What are we at? I don't have the timer on this one. Oh, 24 minutes. Okay. Let me just set my timer. I forgot to do it at the beginning. So six more minutes. There we are. Okay, let's keep going. Dean's Sig. Hi Matt, love the channel and what you guys do. Thank you. I have two questions. First off, would you ever consider doing a 30k narrative campaign? Yes, definitely. We kind of did one. Like, it was more like a narrative group of battle reports with the, the WA, the Primark, the Primark, which has been coming out. 
but yeah, for sure, 30K narrative campaign would be on our list of possible campaigns to do. We got, honestly, the number of different ideas we can do for narrative campaigns is like the number of different ideas there are for movies out there. It's just a ton, so we just kind of do whichever one we want to do next. Secondly, as a new player to Warhammer with no friends in a hobby, how would you recommend I meet people to start playing with? Well, you have to find a place where people are already playing. You could do the work yourself and start a club, get your friends into it. It's a lot of work. I'm incredibly lucky because we're in an area where I would have a hard time getting games in. Uh, like recently we had a store open not too far from us, but before that there wasn't really good places to go unless you're going about an hour away. And, but obviously we got our studios and people come to us. But if I weren't in that situation and I wanted to play, then I would definitely try to find a store. And if it didn't have a really good following, I would try to work with the store owner and be kind of like the, the ambassador to try to get people going into it and run leagues and campaigns and all that kind of stuff. That's what I would do. So, or unless you're lucky and there's already stuff like that going on at your local store. So find local stores, find local clubs. And if that, none of those exist, and you've got the, the energy and the desire to do it, then you can try to start your own. I don't mean to start your own store. Well, if you want to, you can. But I just mean to start getting other people into the hobby and building up interest so you can have a few friends to play against. Martin Olten. I might have missed it, but what happened to the Dark Angels slow grow? I was enjoying watching your progress with everyone choosing your next units. Did you guys finish that? Oh, no. You didn't end up... Okay, because I knew you were scheduled to finish it, but you no, didn't end up... It kind of just... <laughs> It kind of went, yeah, because it got a little imbalanced, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So they were planning on filming like a final one, but I think that just kind of get kept getting pushed back. So you didn't miss it. It just kind of didn't work because uh, things were very, very unbalanced. Uh, Phoenix King, Matt, I got a question about old characters from narrative campaigns. In Wars on Apothis, you said that different narratives might come together like Avengers of sort. Is there a plan to tie current narrative with previous storylines, or are you just going to focus on new content? We actually already do that. We make hints at cross stuff. We haven't done like a campaign which brings a bunch of them together, but in my mind, all of these campaigns are happening in the same universe. I don't just mean the 40k universe, I mean mini wargaming's 40k universe. Our little, you know, mini wargaming canon for it. So all of these are actually happening in the same universe. Do I have plans to tie them together? Definitely. Uh, I don't necessarily going to do like one big overarching story, galaxy finishing, epic thing, but you'll definitely see crossovers between them. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that definitely is in plan. Like for example, Tyrus Incident featured Sentinels of the Forge, as did the World Engine, but the World Engine ones were trapped in the warp and these Sentinels of the Forge weren't, but they're actually the same chapter. It's not a retcon and that'll be possibly explained in the future. I have ideas for how I could explain it in future narrative campaigns, so I do have plans for it, but uh, we'll, see how, we'll see how it evolves. I don't have it like mapped out like, like Marvel did or Disney did for how they're going to develop the Avengers kind of thing and all the different phases. We're not that in depth. I um, don't think I have the attention span to plan that far ahead, to be honest. Okay. Big Gaz J. Hello, Matthew. Now that you've, you have wetted your feet in Blood Bowl, I was wondering if you were a head coach and the mini wargaming crew were your players, firstly, which race would you be and who would play in which position? Also, if you had to, who would be left on the bench? Oh, that's a, that's a bad question. Well, I can't think of any of the non-human teams that we would be. So let's say that we'd be a human team and maybe we'd be recruiting from some other teams as well. So let's go through this. Where does my mind go right away? Benchwarmer. Is Quirk a bench warmer? No, Quirk's like one of the elves. Maybe like like who? You're a runner. Yeah, he's he's a runner, so I, I'd make him I don't know what kind of elf, a wood elf, high elf not a dark elf, probably probably a wood elf or a high elf or just a regular elf. <laughs> um, Steve obviously would be more in a blocking position. Obviously. Center. Yeah. Movement movement like three, movement two. He'd be like the treeman. He'd probably take root half the time. He'd be like a five plus orb take root. I don't want to move. This spot is fine. Yeah, so he'd have a take root, like horribly take root. Always takes root. That would be his, his special rule. Um, we'd have, Lee would have a low movement agility, a movement of value as well, because I'd, and I'd make him a blocker. Uh, Chris for sure would be a thrower. I just picture him as like in the back, just hucking the ball at somebody. Will he be good at it? Probably not, but I can still picture him doing it. So he'd be like an agility two thrower with like the pass skill. So 
but not sure hands. Just pass. Because you probably have a hard time picking up the ball. But throwing it, be good. Maybe give him a strong arm to make up for his bad agility. Because I could picture him just hucking the ball really far. Who would be on the other side of catching? For some reason, Justin came to my mind right away. I could just see him like running down the other side. Um, so he'd be a catcher. And what's that? With the, with the loner skill? <laughs> That's mean. You're mean. I think, honestly, I think the entire team would have the loner skill, to be honest. Because nobody would want to listen to the head coach. Or they'd argue about it long enough that that's basically four plus. They just it it only happens on a four plus. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, well, that's all right. I'll finish this question. Uh, Rob, definitely one of the cheerleaders. And <laughs> who haven't I said anything about? I, I said Josh. Oh I, I, oh, I was thinking Josh is another blocker. I just picture Steve, Josh, and and Lee as the guys I'd put on the line of scrimmage and be the blockers. I'd put Steve in the middle because he'd always take root. Um, but jo well, like Lee would have a, a, a regular take root rule, but Steve's would definitely be like, always takes root rule. Um, and Quirk would have a special rule that would be like, he's gotta, be, he's gotta have sprint, the sudden burst of speed that comes from consuming energy drinks. <laughs> I could. <laughs> But he, he's got like super sprint. He can actually go for it like seven times. <laughs> and if he fails, he automatically just like falls forward and stands back up and keeps going. He's like, blah, 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 straight across. I can just picture that. Yeah. But then after the first half, he would have to be left out for the rest of the game. Because his lungs would collapse. Too he's too tired. <laughs> he'd, have a, he'd have a second skill called, uh, called caffeine crash. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of fun. Uh, Dave, what would Dave be? I think he'd be the, uh, the co-head coach. <laughs> so our re-rolls wouldn't work half the time because we would each have a different idea of what they should do. So, so you did that and, that, and that stacks as a loner. So loner makes it like 25% of the time they actually only work. Did I miss anybody? I feel like I've missed somebody. What are you doing? I'm a head coach. He said if I was the head coach. So I don't have to be a player. But if I was, I'd be a runner. Let's face it, we all played paintball together. <laughs> yeah, I'd be a beastman with a leap. <laughs> and very long legs. So it's a two plus rather than a three plus. <laughs> so there you go, there's your answer. Thank you so much for the questions, that was fun. I'm gonna continue answering for the vault members, of course. You can click the link below to go and watch that now. If you're not a vault member, Click it, get a free seven-day trial, which gives you instant access to that and all the other stuff that's in the vault. Just remember, the vault trial does not limit what you can access. So you can binge watch all you like, decide if you like it. Most people do. It really helps support us. I want to emphasize that. I, I'm so appreciative of all the vault members we have. It's, it's kind of ridiculous that we're able to do this and considering like just what we're doing and that people are paying for that content. And we really, really are appreciative of that. So thank you so much for supporting us. And if you're not a Vault member and you want to support us, that's the best way to do it. And so just click the link below, sign up for a free seven-day trial, even just get the bronze, doesn't matter. Anything helps. And uh, yeah, let's just jump right into that. I'll see you in the next video.